In what appeared to be a relatively uninspiring Tynwald Order paper, one of the expected highlights was the Treasury Minister's statement. As things turned out, Laurie Hooper's resignation overshadowed everything else, but Alex Allenson's statement explained a lot, both in what he did and didn't say. The temporary rise in the higher rate of income taxes looking more permanent than we'd been led to believe, and the pension triple lock is likely to be removed, but there was some good news hinted at in the statement too. Here's how Mr Allenson began his statement. Mr President, when I stood here in this Honourable Court in February to present this year's budget, I spoke of the island's ongoing resilience in a tough economic environment and announced continuing increased investment in our core public services, including health and social care, education, infrastructure, our police, fire and rescue service and civil defence. But I also made it quite clear that to ensure long-term financial stability and to afford such investment, it is vital that expenditure is balanced against sufficient revenue-raising capacity. I set out a medium-term financial plan that, if adhered to, would stabilise our financial position and once again allow our general reserves to be replenished. I committed to publish quarterly management accounts to enhance democratic scrutiny. The first quarter report, which covers the period up to July, was published last week, and the second quarter report and the Isle of Man government audited accounts for the year ended 31st of March 2024 will be published early next month. Despite inflation dropping from 7.2% in February to 2.2%, financial pressures persist, and a number of departments are forecasting a possible overspend of their agreed budgets. A large component of this relates to our spending on health and social care, where Manx Care's forecast of position indicates a potential overspend of around £17 million. Whilst Manx Care have set in place a cost improvement plan which could address up to £10 million of the pressures, there is little doubt that the pressure on our NHS will remain considerable, especially as we approach the winter months. Whilst I appreciate the complexity of health and care services and welcome the efforts being made by the Manx Care Board, it is important that we help the clinicians and the wider organisation to meet this challenge head-on and coordinated action must be taken to address this matter. We'll hear more about the Treasury Minister's statement later in the programme, but first, the former Health Minister's resignation. We should begin with the, the, the bombshell dropped by your colleague for Ramsey, uh, Laurie Hooper. Uh, it, basically, he feels that he's not getting the backing or wasn't getting the backing from the chief minister and his position had become untenable. Yeah, I, I was very surprised. I, I didn't see this coming. Um, I spent uh, this weekend with Laurie. We did our, our regular uh, MHK surgery up in Ramsey. Um, I know he's been under considerable pressure over the last couple of weeks. I, I know he's found it very difficult to reconcile his commitment for um, the health service and, and his com- commitment to work with Manx Care with some of the budgetary pressures they've been under. Um, and I think that, that that's shown through some of the things he, he said in, in the media and, and, and his feelings. I'm just very sorry to see him go. He, he's been absolutely instrumental in terms of um, getting Manx Care to the place it is. I think the, you know I've been very keen to say that our health service is not broken, but it is under significant pressure. And we need to be honest about those pressures to the Manx people, but also see this as part of wider pressures throughout government. So I'm very sorry to see see him go, given all the work that he's put into this, um, and and hope, hope now that we can um, pick up from from the the things that he achieved and he's done, but also go forward with with Manx Care to deliver the services that I know that we're all committed to to doing. One of my uh, great heroes in Tinwald uh, was the late Eddie Lowey. And I'm guessing if Eddie were back in Tinwald now, he would be saying one of the reasons that we've been having various debates, one of the reasons Laurie Hooper has ultimately decided to to step down is because government isn't coming forward with the solutions that are required. So we know uh, from Manx Care that they feel that they are underfunded and we know that somehow a new funding model needs to be developed. Uh, Your uh, statement 
didn't give us much by way of clues, which you may be proud of, I don't know, but uh, you, you didn't give us an awful lot of, of clues as to where the, the solution might lie. I mean, the, the, the funding solutions to adequately fund um, healthcare services are, are an ongoing battle for all Treasury ministers and all health ministers to provide the services when technology is increasing, when people are... Um, you know, de- developing the same problems, but but you can treat them in completely different ways. It is, it is a constant struggle. I, I think I, I was honest in the statement that we, we've looked at various options. We introduced an increase in the upper tax rate in February. That has helped bridge the gap, but then we've seen forecast overspends even with that, with Manx Care. And I think it is absolutely right that, that we say we need a healthcare system that provides the services, but also a healthcare system that we can afford, and a healthcare system that we can afford where the budget doesn't strip um, other quite, you know, really important priorities, such as education, such as infrastructure, such as our border security, such as our connectivity. Um, Health and social care is incredibly important to a lot of people, but so are all those other government services. And we shouldn't look, um, you know, ignore the the role of Timwald of balancing all those priorities. It it, it cannot be right that um, the people who shout loudest get the most in terms of a budget. There are departments that are really working hard to come in on budget who deserve equal respect for doing that. Ironically, one of the things that uh, Laurie Hooper has said to me subsequent to his resignation is that he doesn't feel the Chief Minister is committed enough to our island plan and the economic strategy and effectively I think our island plan talks about investment in health, investment in education, investment in our infrastructure to ensure that actually the Isle of Man is a a great place to live and work, people will want to come to the island. Uh, Unfortunately these sorts of stories uh, that that inevitably generated by the health minister feeling that he has to has to resign these these aren't helping get that uh, message about the Isle of Man being a great place to 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 relocate to I, I agree with you I mean a lot of the things that have gone on in the health service during um, Laurie's Laurie's post they've been incredibly positive but they're not things that you can necessarily picture the improvements in safety the improvements in transparency, the improvements in communication. We now take it for granted that you can go online and look at a waiting list. We now take it for granted that you can phone MCALs and have your complaint or your query answered really quickly. We now take it for granted that the the, the safety of, of the various um, services that are offered have been assessed independently. You only have to look a couple of years ago where there were real worries about the provision of surgery, for instance, at uh, Nobles. Now we, we have that validation that actually it is improving, that safety is there for people going into hospital, that they can rest assured that themselves or their relatives will be treated by the right people at the right time with the right equipment. So a huge amount of work has gone on and a huge amount of investment has, has been put in. What people were talking about, the overall amounts of money, it is quite staggering when you look at the tens of millions of pounds, actually over £100 million pounds since 2021 has gone into to the Department of Health and Social Care to provide extra service. The, it, it, whilst I think you know anyone working in healthcare will always ask for more, we've still got to get that balance right across the the, the, the piece in terms of the other government services, and and if we don't get that balance right, it will destabilise the economy and have exactly the knock-on effects you say. We've seen significant investment in education, and again, it's about standards, it's about quality of service, as well as provision of that service, and investment in, in infrastructure. It was interesting today, we had some calls to halt the, the capital programme and other people calling for more support for, for, for the infrastructure and the construction industry. We have to get this balance right, and I think part of the island plan, the economic strategy, was to do that. I'm still committed to that. I know the chief minister is, and I know the rest of the council of ministers are. Can we afford a, or continue to afford, a free at the point of delivery uh, National Health Service on the Isle of Man? Yes, we can. I think Timwald has been quite clear in its commitment to that ethos. 
But what we have to also look at is the meeting the overall budget. So, for instance, we haven't put up prescription charges for, for, for years. We haven't moved forward in terms of looking at the allocation of funding into primary care. We haven't really looked at the eligibility criteria for a whole range of things, including eye tests, dental treatment, um, various drugs that, that, are, that are given without prescription. And so we have to look at all these. People won't like it. It is change. We need to look at patient transfer. We need to look at some of the other services that we provided, which are really important for people. But actually, what is most important for me is looking at those emergency, essential and crisis services to make sure that people absolutely rest assured that if they get seriously unwell, they get the treatment, the right treatment and prompt treatment. And that's where we have to balance that with some of the other things that Manx Care are continuing to have to provide, which probably are distracting them from the core essential services that they do. Again, uh, Minister Hooper has suggested, uh, very clearly suggested, in fact, that the Chief Minister wishes to see uh, elements of the NHS privatised. Uh, is that something you've detected in Comin meetings? No, I haven't, actually. I, I disagree with, with Laurie on that. We already have areas of, of healthcare privatised. We've had the dental service privatised because they wouldn't play ball with an NHS contract. We've got ophthalmic services privatised as well. It, it has happened. But the core essential services in terms of medical and social care, we know that they're far better provided by a large organisation like Max Care. Um, the economies of scale are there, even on a small island. So certainly when we've been talking talking in, in terms of funding for the health care and the priorities of the health care, that's all been alongside the Manx Care mandate, the need to preserve an NHS for our island, which is put out in primary legislation. So I'm guessing uh, the reason that council ministers, according to Laurie uh, Hooper, were, were unwilling to give an unequivocal uh, we believe in a free of the point of delivery uh, NHS is because as you've just described, it is a little bit more nuanced than that. There are always a degree of compromise. And, and I think what, what Laurie Hoop has found is that he's not prepared to compromise some of his principles. I find I'm very saddened by that because, as I said, I really appreciated working with him around the Council of Ministers and have done since the start of this administration. Um, but actually, when you know, when we're looking at balancing those priorities right across government, there has to be some compromise um, some, somewhere. And I think all of us in terms of ministers and the chief minister himself has, have, have had to accept that. When you look at what we've gone through over the last three years in terms of pandemics, wars in Europe, inflation, interest rates, a whole range of issues inside government throughout our community and around the world, the fact that we're still functioning, the fact that we've still got financial stability, optimism, finan economic growth is a real testament to the stability of the Isle of Man and the Isle of Man's economy. One thing you alluded to in your statement was at budget time, inflation was running at 7.2%. I'm guessing at budget time you had, uh, or your team in Treasury had predicted inflation would go down. Um, it has, it's down to 2.2%, uh, but the pressures don't appear uh, to, to have been lifted um, uh, that perhaps you might have hoped for. Yes, I, I, we have been quite clear and we publish on the economic dashboard what our projections are, um, but projecting far into the future has been very difficult over the last couple of years. We um, were fairly certain that um, inflation would come down, that interest rates would start to come down as well, and that would relieve some of the immediate pressures. But of course, inflation is only about prices going up. It's not prices going down. We've got baked in increased costs throughout government, which is why when we did the budget in February and needed um, to increase taxation, we rebase some of those budgets rather than instituted top slicing right across all departments, which we knew would directly affect um, you know, the services we offer to the people of the Isle of Man. I think going forward to, to next year's budget, we're going to have to really look at things like public sector pay, the headcount, which the Chief Minister has already talked about, driving um, efficiencies and productivity, doing more for the same, or in some cases perhaps less for the same, or you know, more more with less. 
Um, but certainly, I think it's absolutely right that we as a government are responsible for the, the, the income, the revenue we, we take out of the economy and try to put as much back into that to drive economic growth and make sure people are in well-paid employment and actually feel the, feel the benefits of the economic strategy in the island plan. One of the biggest expenses that government faces, of course, is paying pensions. Um, you mentioned in, in both at budget time and you again came back to this uh, in your statement that the uh, the triple lock um, was to be removed. Uh, this is the UK triple lock, which guarantees uh, increases uh, to pensioners. Uh, but you also suggested that you were removing this triple lock, but you still wanted to make sure that pensions increased in line with inflation or, or, or kept up with inflation. Isn't this a bit like trying to have your cake and eat it? Either you are removing the triple lock because you need to save money, therefore the pension won't be uh, keeping up in, in, in the way that, you, uh, that many pensioners certainly would like. Um, is that not the case? We're not cutting pensions. We're not trying to save money. What we're trying to do is save the National Insurance Fund. We have repeated actuarial valuations that show if we do nothing, the fund's going to run out in the next few decades. We've done some um, quite in-depth modelling with the same actuaries to say if we moved away from the triple lock and increased pensions on the rate of inflation and had a, a, a floor there of at least 2%, would it still exist? And actually, the answer is yes. So there are sensible changes we can make now to make sure that the National Insurance Fund is sustainable in the long term, because we need to make sure that those people who've got pensions now have the security that they carry on being paid, but also those people currently working, paying national insurance, know that they'll get a pension when they eventually get round to retiring. We've also looked at a whole range of other issues such as um, extending the retirement age or extending the qualifying years you have to put in. And these will all be documented in, in the paper that we're publishing later on this week. What they show is, is actually a very well considered attitude to looking at long term certainty and sustainability for the National Insurance Fund. There are no raids on the fund, there are no, chart, no signs to try to save money from pensioners. We want to make sure that everyone is guaranteed a pension. But we we also want to make sure that that is for now and in the future. Some elements of your statement um, p- piqued my interest for what they didn't say. Um, so what you did say was that uh, you'd increased child benefits uh, in the last budget and you were reviewing the rates. Now, I'm wondering why you would say that, uh, uh, be- because... You know, everyone knows that you increased them. Uh, you're now reviewing them. Does that mean that the increase maybe was a little bit too much? No, and that's, I think that's one of the problems when um, politicians are pressing me for what's going to be in the budget for February. Um, I, 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 I'm trying not to give any spoilers. We're, we're still working out um, some of the details of, of how we have a balanced budget going forward, how we stick to the medium-term financial plan, which is all about reducing the drawdowns on reserves. It was all about getting back to a balanced position where we're putting money back into the reserves. We've had far too many rainy days. We need to now get back to a normal balanced budget. But what I did say in February was that we would review the tax thresholds. We would review the national insurance thresholds because that was one of the things that I know Timwell members and the general public thought was unfair. Um, the, this horrible word of fiscal creep has come in um, and people said, well, look, I'm earning more money. I'm just paying more and more tax. This is unfair. We want to get that sense of fairness back, both in terms of the national insurance system, in terms of the taxation system, in terms of the benefit system. So the other things I was talking about today is looking at those people who are on long term sickness um, support and saying, what can we do to help them back? Now, again, this is something that's been trying to be tackled in the United Kingdom. We're looking at the increasing number of young people who are off on long-term sick for long periods of time due to mental health problems. It's not your traditional 40 and 50-year-olds with back problems or joint problems due to manual work. We're seeing a whole generation now that's been signed off sick 
who I believe we can help with the right support, with the right intervention, we can help get back to it to being um, more active in society, not just for their own sake and their family's sake, but for the community's sake. And I think we need to tackle this head on. So that's one of the other initiatives we're going to be bringing in and cementing in the, in the next budget to try to give that tailored approach and tailored support to people out there who are really struggling. There was a, <clears throat> a couple of... Uh other points you you made in the statement which uh, I was interested in, well, I mean, the obvious one is uh, the removal of my card, which is going to save half a million pounds. Uh, but there are people, um, probably elderly pensioners, who have always been used to going either to a bank or to the post office to get their money to spend during the weekend. They like spending £10 or £20 notes. They, they, they wouldn't know what to do with a card if, if it was the last thing in the, in the world. Um, it, how are they going to be impacted when, uh, I think it's the end, is it the end of the next financial year or the end of the next calendar yeah, year so that my card is removed? So, so again, this is, this is a, an issue that's been... People have been tiptoeing around for years in terms of the MyCard system. We, we know when it was brought in, it was meant to be expanded and dealt with other areas of, of government services. It never really took off in that way. Um, and it's become quite an expensive system with a decreasing number of people, uh, people using it because more and more people are getting benefits paid into their bank account and then going to the bank or going to the, get the cash point or using um, their, 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 their debit card for purchases. What we're looking at is is to move everyone towards um, the, the using their bank account and have direct transfers and that. We've made the changes already to make sure that people can elect to have their benefits paid on a weekly, fortnightly or monthly basis. Now there's a lot more variety. But we also know that there are some people who will still not be able to do that for whatever reason. And so we're looking at alternative methods of getting the cash to them. And we'll be announcing those in the, during the course of next year. What I've tried to do is give that certainty both to those people and to the, to the people who, who run some sub, sub post offices, that this will be a gradual process over the next 14 months to give that certainty and stability that there's, there's time to change, adapt, adjust, and get the support that people need. And finally, in your statement, uh, you mentioned, of course, the somewhat unpopular 2% increase in higher rate income tax, which pretty much anyone who pays tax on the Isle of Man pays. Uh, there are very few people, I think, that don't. Um, at the time that the tax was introduced, or at least certainly sh- shortly after the budget, there were c- clear statements that this was a temporary measure and that there would be a new solution found. But in your statement, you have alluded to the uh, to the options for a replacement to the 2% as not being uh, as easy to find as perhaps you might have thought. Is it that the options aren't as easy to find, or is it that Comin has basically rejected a number of the options? Um, the, the options are, are not easy to find. They involve ch- changes to primary legislation, which takes time in Timwell to get through in terms of primary tax legislation, also tax legislation that will need to comply with international standards as well. So it has been quite complex to look at some of the solutions I, I, I was considering and that I mentioned in February's budget. Um, the the I, the aspiration to reduce income tax back down the headline figure to 2%, but have a healthcare levy at the side that would raise extra money for health and social care is still there. What we need to do is work on that. After the budget, obviously, there were a lot of conversations with the tax strategy about the need for more consultation with the public. And so we're looking at that as well to bring people on on board and explain and, and, and make sure that people are clear what we're doing, why we're doing it, and what the benefits that they'll find in terms of some of the issues we've been talking about today in terms of the overall budget, particularly with the amount of money that's now being needed for frontline services. And I know I did say finally, but um, let's let's finish on a more optimistic note. Uh, you also mentioned that by 2027, uh, thanks to the changes that are going to be introduced in relation to the international business, big international business, uh, there's potential for an extra £25 million pounds, uh, of tax coming into the island. I mean, one, one of the parts of the tax strategy, the economic strategy, and all these sort of things, was trying to widen the tax base. Now, the Isle of Man has always existed in terms of 
um, low corporation tax to try to entice businesses to work here, employ people, add to the wealth of our nation. Um, we've got the, a global minimum um, corporation tax of 15% coming to the large multinationals. We've signed up to that alongside Jersey and Guernsey. We've signed up to that along with a huge number of countries right the way around the world, including the UK. The changes we brought in in February in terms of banks and large retailers were the first step. From January 25, we'll start taxing some of the other big multinational companies. That will bring in extra revenue. That's the money that they on tax on profits they make on the island, but that they would have to pay anywhere. Um, that they were based. So what we're trying to do is make sure that the, the, pro- the tax um, that we take is fair. We will work with those companies to make sure that they're on a level playing field um, with, the, with the rest of the world. But we will also make sure that we use that tax wisely to invest in our economy and make sure that the Isle of Man is still a fantastic place to live, work and invest in. And I understand that uh, the Chief Minister has currently got a vacancy in health. Do you fancy it? Um, I've always been been quite clear that I'll go anywhere where um, the Chief Minister would, would like me to go. Um, I started off in this administration in enterprise, then moved to Treasury. And what we need, and, and what, what, what does, I suppose, frustrate me uh, about today, is we need political stability, financial stability, and economic stability. Um, one backbencher at lunchtime said my speech was boring. From a Treasury perspective, boring is good. We need stability, certainty, um, and to get that right, business and, per- and public confidence in what we're doing. And so um, the resignation of ministers I do take seriously. I do regret Laurie Hooper's po- you know, points um, that, that he made and also re- regret his actions, but I appreciate that that's, that's his stance. We need to put that behind us. We need to move forward and actually give the the, the people of Alabama what they need, which is a strong, stable government going forward with the right policies and the right agenda, which I think we absolutely have. That was Treasury Minister and MHK for Ramsey, Alex Allenson. So what do you think? Does the Treasury Minister exude calm and confidence at a time of political turbulence? Did you expect more from his autumn statement? Are you reassured to learn that Alex Allenson supports a health service free at the point of delivery? Or do you think that we should be prepared to pay a bit more to ensure frontline services aren't cut? Don't forget, this programme is available as a podcast on Max Radio's website. For now, though, I'm Phil Gorn. Goromayu, thanks for listening.